In this video, I'm going to teach you about some electron configuration exceptions. You see, when determining an element's electron configuration, nearly all of the elements follow the pattern that you would normally predict. However, there are five exceptions. For instance, let's pretend you were trying to figure out the electron configuration of chromium, which is down here in box 24. What you would do is you'd start up here at the hydrogen box and you'd go 1s1, 1s2, then you'd go down to the lithium box and go 2s1, 2s2, and then you'd jump from beryllium here all the way over to boron where you hit the 2p row and you go 2p1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Then you go from neon down here to sodium on row 3 and you go 3s1, 2, and then you jump all the way over here to aluminum where you say 3p1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and then you go to row 4 where you say 4s1, 2. Now as you go from calcium over here to scandium, you're of course going to go down one row to 3d1 just as I talked about in an earlier video. And then you would assume moving across to chromium that you'd go 3d1, 2, 3, and 4. Thus, just doing it the straightforward way, you would assume that chromium's electron configuration would be that of argon, which is the noble gas that precedes it, followed by 4s2, 3d4. However, if you assumed this, you would unfortunately be wrong. In reality, chromium's electron configuration is actually argon 4s1, 3d5. I'll now explain to you why. If you look at the periodic table and analyze chromium more carefully, you'll see that its full electron configuration is, or you would think at least it would be, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d4. Now that's actually not what it is, but you'd think that it would be that. So if I actually draw a little orbital energy diagram like this and fill this up, I of course fill from the bottom up, that's the alpha bow principle, and I don't pair until I have to. 1s2 indicates that in its 1s orbital that's closest to the nucleus, lowest in energy, I have two electrons. I've got 2s2, so I have two electrons. In the 2p, I've got six, so I fill them up. I don't pair until I have to, that's Hun's rule. So now I'm gonna pair, and I've got 2p6. Then I got 3s2, so I'll lay that down there, 3p6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then, like I said, this is what you'd think chromium would be. It'd be 4s2, 3d4, 1, 2, 3, 4. By the way, you might notice that the 3d uh, shell is a little bit lower in energy than the 4s. Why? Because it's got a 3 in front of it. So even so, d's in the same row on the periodic table are actually a little bit closer to the nucleus than the corresponding s's and p's in the same row. Now, like I said, all of this electron configuration right here is the same electron configuration as that of argon. These are all the core electrons for chromium. I'm going to kind of ignore them and focus here on the outer electrons, the 4s and the 3d. So in the orbital energy diagram, I'm just going to look at the top uh, two rows. Okay, I want you to look at that. Do you see that? Do you see any issues with that? Yeah, there is a slight issue, and that is this. As I mentioned before, uh, atoms don't want to pair electrons up unless they have to. This element, chromium, has an empty d orbital just sitting there, ready to be filled. And, then it, and it's actually at a lower energy level, which means it is more stable than the corresponding 4s. But this 4s has two electrons that are stuck together, paired. They don't want that if they can avoid it. And there's this empty, lower energy, more stable orbital just sitting there. So what does chromium do? Well, yeah, it just takes this electron and moves it down. The reason it does that is so that now it can have all of its valence electrons totally unpaired. And thus, chromium's correct electron configuration is actually here at the end. It's not 4s2, 3d4. It's 4s1, 3d5. Weird? Yes. Is it unique to chromium? Yes, kind of. At least it's unique to that column. So the elements on either side of chromium, which are vanadium and manganese, they don't do this. However, the element that's immediately beneath chromium on the periodic table, which is molybdenum, also does the same thing. The difference, however, is that molybdenum's outer shell is not 4s, 3d, it's 5s. 4d, but molybdenum behaves analogously. So molybdenum's electron configuration would be krypton 5s1 4d5. And once again, the reason is because by doing this, it can have all of its valence electrons completely unpaired. And to boot, it gets one of the upper electrons actually brought into a lower energy orbital down there. Now I have to show you something else. Now let's take a look at copper, which is kind of toward the end of the D block. It's actually in column nine of the D block. You would think that copper's electron configuration should be that of argon, 
plus 4s2, 3d9. That's what you'd think just kind of going through the motions to figure that out. So just focusing on these valence shells here, the 4s and the 3d, I'm gonna go ahead and draw this out. 4s2 indicates that I have two electrons, then I've got 3d9, nine electrons I have to throw in these five separate 3d orbitals. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Similar to the case of molybdenum and chromium that I just talked about, I ask you, do you see any issues there? Well, yeah, yeah, copper could take one electron out of the 4s and move it down here and pair it up. Now, I told you that electrons don't like to be paired up if you can avoid it within the same orbital. But either way, see, if I, if I keep the electron up here, I have the same exact number of paired electrons as I do if I take it down. So I've just, I've got the same number of paired electrons either way. So why is there an advantage to taking an electron down? The reason is because 3D is in a slightly more stable, lower energy level. So it's actually beneficial for copper to take this electron and bring it down into the 3D shell. Therefore, the correct electron configuration at copper is not argon 4s2, 3D9. It's actually argon 4s1, 3D10. Now the elements on either side of copper don't do anything weird like this. However, the elements that are in the same column beneath copper, which are silver and gold, do. So silver, for instance, you would assume would have an electron configuration of 5s2, 4d9. But for the exact same argument, it's not. It's actually 5s1, 4d10. So here are the five exceptions that you should memorize Chromium, which is element 24 right down here in the periodic table, you would think would have an electron configuration of argon 4s2, 3d4. But in reality, and I just explained why, it actually has an electron configuration of argon 4s1, 3d5. By extension, molybdenum, that's immediately beneath chromium here, you'd think would have an electron configuration of krypton 5s2, 4d4. But in reality, its electron configuration is krypton 5s1, 4d5. By extension, copper, which is over here in column 11 or column 9 of the D block down here, you would think would have an electron configuration of argon 4s2, 3d9. But it doesn't. For the reasons I explained on the board, its true electron configuration is argon 4s1, 3d10. Similar argument can be made for silver, located down here, whose electron configuration you would assume would be krypton 5s2, 4d9, but in reality is krypton 5s1, 4d10. And lastly, we have gold that's located down here, whose electron configuration you would think would be xenon 6s2, 4f14. And yes, we do have to account for that f row, 5d9. However, in reality, it's xenon 6s1, 4f14, 5d10, where it takes that 6s electron down in and pairs it up in the lower energy 5d10 orbital. And all of these exceptions, these five exceptions that you should memorize. The reason that they are exceptional is because in the case of chromium or molybdenum, they bring down a higher energy S electron into the lower energy D orbitals to be able to get all of their electrons unpaired. Or in the case of copper, silver, and gold, they bring a higher energy paired S electron down into a lower energy D orbital just to get the benefit of having it in a lower energy state. Now, I hope that you'll stay tuned to the videos that follow because I'm going to expand on these concepts and then show you a bunch of cool solved example questions.